Hello, everybody. Um, Good to see you all. We're in John chapter 14. Okay. Now, are you in a hurry? No. And we've got uh, a couple of new faces this morning. So glad the kids are here. Do you mind introducing yourselves to everybody? Okay. I'm Dick Keck, and this is my wife, uh, Terry Keck. So we live in Yeah, so good to have you. We know a little Calandra, right? Our human resources director for the school, my Calandra. And let's see, I don't see Doris yet. Uh, oh, here she comes. Oh, it's Joyce. Um, if, if Doris does make it today, we're going to want to sing her a happy birthday. Though her birthday is technically next Monday, right? Friday. Is it Friday of this week? Well, we'll ask her. Yeah, I bet she knows. <laughs> All right. We're in John chapter 14, still in the middle of this, this long unit that stretches uh, through 17, um, where, where Jesus is giving, we might say, his parting words to his faithful apostles uh, after Judas has left, uh, some, some last teachings uh, before he goes to his death on the cross, and so some very significant words uh, in, in all of this, and we will pick up, uh, I suppose the, the best place to start would be uh, in verses 5 and 6, so John 14, 5 and 6. But first, let's open with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you reveal your love and your uh, plan for our salvation uh, to us in your word. And as we gather to study your word, may your Holy Spirit help us so that we may better understand it and by uh, better understanding, uh, more firmly believe it. And so in that way, be a great help in establish our, establishing ourselves and others in the true faith. And in Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Thomas uh, says in verse 5, Thomas uh, said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So uh, Thomas here speaks for all the disciples who have failed to comprehend Jesus' peculiar relation to the father and because of that failure to understand that he's as a result anxious about jesus future and if they would simply put together what jesus is telling them they ought not have such worry christ is in the father the father is in him and therefore whatever is about to happen to jesus uh, is, is not the last word or not the end for Jesus because Jesus is always safe in the Father. He's, um, he says he is the way. He's the way to the Father and to the Father's house. We said last time that this is a very significant way of putting it. He's the way. He's not the guide to point the way. He's the way itself. And the only way to the exclusion of all other ways and means of coming to the Father. He's the way because he is the truth, the absolute, we might say, he's the, the fullness and the reality of God's revelation to man. Uh, the fullness of the revelation of how man is reconciled to God. And this was signaled to us already in the very prologue of the Gospel of John, if you go back to John chapter 1, remember those, those early words where it says, um, like verse 9, John 1 verse 9, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then it says, 
The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glory as of the only son from, of, from the father, full of grace and truth. There it is again, truth. I'm the way, the truth. Um, verse 16, from his fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Christ, Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who's at the Father's side, he's made him known. And so now we have Jesus himself saying these same things uh, in, in a slightly different way that he uniquely reveals the Father to us. So he is the, the absolute truth. Um, and now he's, and because he's that, he's also the life of the world. He's the life of the world. And so uh, now as he's about to depart for his passion and death, uh, he knows his disciples need to be impressed with the fact that he is the life in such a way that everything that's going to happen in the next 24 hours does not change that. Uh, as much as the next few, uh, the, the next big events in the gospel will suggest the opposite, he is the life. And, and death cannot uh, change that. Um, so it's, it's also important to recognize that these words are said in the context that they are said in, that Jesus being the way, the truth and the life, right, is, is not, cannot be separated from the fact that he attains salvation for the rest of us by being our mediator. The, the only way Jesus can be the way, the truth, and the life is by becoming one of us in our place and then dying in our place, receiving in our place the punishment we deserve as sinners. That that's how he is the way. And remember also what, what we saw earlier in the gospel. Remember he said he's the door to the sheepfold. He's the door. He doesn't open the door. He doesn't uh, point to the door. He himself is the door. And that image of the shepherd, you know, standing at the, the, the opening of the enclosure where the sheep are kept and his own sheep go between his legs to, to, to enter the enclosure. So he is literally the door as he stands there guarding that that space against all robbers or wolves uh, but but what's the means of entrance himself and and, and so it is our means of, of entry into uh, the the kingdom of God is is Jesus himself but Jesus himself as the one who died and rose for us who is our substitute all right Anything about that? Because it, it's, it's worth coming back to that before we move into to new verses, because the things that are said next flow out of, out of that key statement. Okay. Um, verse 7, notice it says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is a great now and not yet kind of passage. Two things at once. You don't know me, and therefore you don't know the Father. But you do know him, and you have seen him. See, how, how can this be? Uh, in, in these words, we might say there's both a rebuke and an encouragement. That is to say, it's a rebuke because Jesus is telling his disciples that they don't yet know him as they ought to know him by this time. But it's also an encouragement that even now they are further advanced in their knowledge than they themselves realize. Uh, so uh, the moment we start talking about seeing the Father, another question arises. And this time the question is asked by Philip. Philip said to him, Lord, 
show us the Father, and it's enough for us. <laughs> Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Um, who else requested to see God? In the Bible, very famous Moses. Moses, uh, Moses on the mountain asked to see the face of God, to see His glory, and we get that in Exodus chapter thirty-three. If you want to turn real quickly, keep your finger in John fourteen and turn to Exodus thirty-three. See where this happened. In um, around verse 20, that you get what happened. Um, let's see, Exodus 33, and um, look at verse. Yeah, verse 18. You know, it, it's, it's worth um, going back to 15. You know, th this is uh, our, our memory verse this week in the school is, Lo, I am with you always. And, and I love that uh, as the, the very last words of the Gospel of Matthew in our faculty study earlier this week, we talked about how the fact that, that the gospel of Matthew begins and ends, basically, with this note of God being with us. That, that when the birth of Jesus is announced to, to Joseph, it's, it's, it's in Matthew's account that we get Joseph's side of the story. Joseph, who contemplates divorcing Mary and, and the angel assuring him that uh, what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and that uh, this child will be a uh, fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah, that his name will be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So right off the bat, Matthew chapter 1. And then Matthew 28, very end of the gospel, you have Jesus' last words to his disciples, the last words of the whole book, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So the baby to be born is God with us. And here's that baby grown up, having died and risen, and, and saying, I'm with you. I'm with you always. And, and, and notice here how, how important that has always been for God's people. Because Moses has just finished saying in verse 15 that what, what God has basically said is, look, I'm going to see to it. That, that you still make it to the promised land, you, you still get your enemies defeated, but, but I'm not going with you. You're, you're, you're on your own. Uh, I, I've had it. And what is Moses saying? If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. He, he's got exactly the opposite attitude of us in most circumstances. Uh, so long as you give me the stuff I want, wh whether you're here or not is, is, is of no consequence. And Moses is saying, I'd rather you take the stuff away and stay. Don't let us beat our enemies. Don't give us the promised land, but don't leave us yourself. See, um, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every, every other people on the face of the earth? That's the most important thing, God's presence. God being with us always. See? And, and that gets ultimately fulfilled 
through Christ. Christ makes it possible for God to be with us always. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you've spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, now he goes for broke. Well, I, I got that one, <laughs> right? Uh, well, why, why not uh, go, for uh, yeah, go for another? Yeah. What, what's the worst that can happen? Uh, please show me your glory. And he said, I'll make all my goodness. This is God's answer to him. I'll make all my goodness pass before me and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and will show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And, and then the uh, account of being placed in the cleft of the rock. Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft of the rock, and I'll cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So God hid him in the rock, rock of ages. God passed by, and Moses saw only his back. So uh, as far as we know, that's the last time someone asked such a thing of God. So what Philip is asking is pretty audacious, given what we know God's answer was to Moses back in the day. Uh, Jesus has just said, now you know him and have seen him. Philip's immediate reply is, well, show us the Father. That's enough for us. So when Jesus says, now you do know him, what does he mean? Yeah. So to know him is to know who? Jesus. Yeah. So Philip basically says, show us the father. And Jesus says, here I am. Now they know him. And here's kind of the now and the not yet part. And, and this is one of the most fundamentally important points in all the teachings of the New Testament. That there are these two realities constantly simultaneously true that we already have the kingdom of God and yet the kingdom of God hasn't yet come fully the thing we have we have it now and yet there is more of it to come the now and the not yet they don't yet know and understand and yet they do already they're with Jesus and Jesus is already teaching them and and I hope this isn't uh, going too far, but it, it's important to recognize that what are we as Christians? What does what, what Jesus tell the apostles to make of all the nations, to make disciples? What's a disciple? Yeah, Rose, you, 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 you got the key word there. What is a disciple? What, what does the very word mean? Follow, follow. Okay, we, we say follower, but it but it's literally student. Make students of all nations. I, I greet my Latin class every every beginning of class. Salvate these people. I'm saying hello, students. That's what the word means. It's what it means in Latin. It's what it means. It's what it means in Greek. So. To be a disciple is to be someone who is always learning. Yes, sir. And, and, and notice what, what, what makes them disciples. They're baptized and they're, they're taught. And so, so long as we are baptized and being taught, we're in. See? So do we know everything yet? No. 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 But we will because we're learning now. It, it, it's like that that there's the now and the not yet we, we, we want to reach that point where we graduate well I to, to, to do that you got to stop breathing yeah. I've tried yeah. and, and that's up to God I hope not Joyce that's up to God that you are with you. he no. takes your breath away you, you, don't, you don't try to give it up yourself uh, <laughs> darn darn he's in control rats um, the uh, that's I think part of what Jesus is saying here 
is look, you are already in the position of learning from the one who alone can get you to the Father. So there's no better place to be in than the one you were already in. Yes, you don't fully see it. Yes, you don't fully experience it yet. But guess what? You already have it because you're with me. You're learning from me. Um, you know, so much of our life, right, is, is a matter of the next thing. Mm -hmm. Got to get to the next thing, the next thing. Uh, you're in school and you can't wait to get to the next grade or graduate and go to college, uh, you know, start the job. And uh, you're on the job and you, you can't wait for that, that vacation, right? Uh, then, then, you know, whatever it is, you can't wait to get married. I can't wait to have a child. can't wait to retire. Can't, uh, always the next thing. And here's Jesus saying, yeah, I know it feels incomplete. It feels like there's something yet to happen. And there is. But be content with the place you are now because you're in the safest place you could possibly be in the position of being a student of me. You know, so, you know, do you ever feel like when you're in the classroom, right? Aha, this is it, learning, right? Uh, my, my teacher's gonna, gonna lay on me a, a new concept today and then I'm soaking it in, in the moment. No, we wanna you know, get on with it. Oh, here's, uh, here's the slow one asking a question we already know the answer to. Or there's so-and-so showing off because he already knows this concept, right? That kind of thing. We're, we're, we're never content in the moment to just be soaking it up and receive it. And, and yet, when, when you do grow up, trust me, you, you, you miss those things, right? Boy, if only I could just spend all my days in the classroom learning. No, um, no, no, I guess that's just me. I'm one of those, uh, right? Uh, perpetual students <laughs> but but th that that's part of it but but this now not yet applies in so many different ways and different aspects to, to to the christian life it's it's true on so many different levels we are both righteous and sinful all at once and the sinful self that's still there until the the, the day god takes us to be with himself it, it must die by little stages, and the new creation grows by stages. And so the two intersect, right? Uh, just in, in, in center at the same time. Here's, here's Jesus saying, when you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. This is so because who is Jesus? Remember what we said, it was it last week or the week before, that the whole significance of him calling himself the Son of Man. Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. He's the son of mankind, man that was made in God's image, given by creation this gift that made man more glorious than any of the rest of creation. Created gift, this bearing the image of God. And then, then what, what, what do we see it say in like Colossians? Like go to, go to Colossians chapter one. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians 1 and verse 15. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll back into it. Let, let's, let's start at verse 12. Uh, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, filled in him, no, no, is that right? In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Do you hear that? He is the image of God, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So he is literally the image of God, the icon of the invisible God. And it's not that he was created in God's image. He is by nature God's image. Jesus is that image in himself. He is greater than Adam in that respect. And therefore, when you see Jesus, 
you see God. Uh, the benediction at the end of the service, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We had that as the Old Testament reading about three Sundays ago. And it, it's, it's very striking. If you go back to, to the original, this is Numbers chapter 6. See what we're, to, to, to tie a bow on the, the Son of Man point. See, God, Jesus, who is the image of God himself, becomes flesh, becomes a member of the human race. How did man start out? Glorious. Made in God's image. But what happened? He sinned. And that sin led to death. Death and no glory. And now God enters the human race. Son of man. Son of mankind. Anthropos. Man in the sense of, of man and woman. Human beings. He picks up where fallen man left off begins in sin and death, takes on our sin and dies, but then rises without sin and lives forever in glory. So we have glory to death. We have Jesus picking up from there and going from death to glory as the son of man. And, and remember, I pointed out that son of man is always used in reference to himself in those two contexts. The son of man will be handed over to sinners crucified see so son of man is is his way of talking about his suffering and death but then it's also his way of talking about coming in glory with the angels on the last day so that this is the thing that makes Caiaphas tear his robes tell us plainly are you the Christ I tell you that you will see the son of man coming in glory on the clouds with the angels and what does Caiaphas do he tears his robes because what does he just claim for himself divinity how can this be? Is Son of Man a way of talking about his suffering and death, or is Son of Man a way of talking about his, his ruling and glory? It's both. The two go together. He gets to glory by way of suffering and death. You follow that? And so likewise, look at this. The, 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 the Trinity, this blessing from uh, Numbers chapter 6. And um, let's see. Verse 24, verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now think about it. You got three lords there, right? The Lord bless you and keep you. God the Father is the source of all blessing. The Lord makes his face shine on you and is gracious toward you. Jesus reveals the face of the invisible God. For his face to shine on you and to be gracious to you means you have through this Lord access to the Father. And then the, the third mention of Lord, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This will be made even clearer in, in the next several chapters of John uh, when Jesus moves to talk about the sending of the Holy Spirit. But what's the Holy Spirit's main role? To create faith, to bring people to Christ, to put his words, Jesus' words in our hearts that we might believe in him as the Savior, the ones sent by the Father. So what's the Holy Spirit in a sense always doing? He's always shining Jesus' face on us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He lifts up Jesus' countenance upon us and thereby gives us peace. So from the beginning, the Aaronic benediction, the, the words of blessing that were given to the high priest Aaron, were a Trinitarian blessing that had at their center Jesus himself. Pretty cool, huh? All right. Um, so, um, Jesus is the face of God. Jesus is, is the, and, and the Holy Spirit lifts up the face of God and, and thereby gives us peace so that when we see Jesus, we've seen the Father. 
Uh, we always come to worship and begin how? In the name of in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit. And then we hear the words of Jesus. Um, Long-standing custom in the church, uh, still observed by us. Uh, now, it's probably a, an even older custom to stand for all of the reading, right? Uh, in, in the old days, everybody stood but the pastor. The pastor read from a seat or preached from a seat, a seated position. Everybody else stood. There weren't pews. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but special honor was shown, especially to the words of Jesus, so that even when congregations could be seated through most of the service, they would still stand for the reading of the gospel. Not that the other readings weren't also the word of God, but now with the gospel reading, by and large, we're hearing Jesus speak to us directly. We get Jesus to word, words directly, and we show that either by, by, if we're already standing, by bowing when the announcement is made of the, the gospel reading, or, or by, if we were seated, we, we stand. Um, we are in the presence of Jesus, uh, the door to the Father's presence. Um, typically at the beginning and the end of the preaching of a sermon, right? We stand, we stand because we're acknowledging all, oh, we're about to hear the words of Jesus applied to, to us. Um, so in seeing Jesus, you see the father, the father sent Jesus, his son, and he's the image of the invisible God. See, God is invisible by himself. He, he, doesn't have a body, he is spirit. But by sending Jesus, it's now possible for us to behold him. That's why he took on flesh, so that we might behold God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, all there in the very beginning of the of the uh, the gospel of John. So when we look on uh, if we want to look at God, we look at Jesus. He is God made visible to us. Um, and this also brings us back to no one comes to the Father except through me. See, the, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes so that we see in Jesus the Father. And at this point, I think our brains all get scrambled, just as the apostles' brains got scrambled when Jesus told them the first time. But that just shows the limits of our brain. Um, <laughs> What if you're a really kind Buddhist? What if you're a really nice Muslim, but don't believe in Jesus? You know, there it is possible to be a nice sinner. I guess it's just as possible to be a mean Christian. Oh, yes. But, but please work on that. Uh, but nice sinners are still sinners. And that may make life on this earth a little bit easier than it would if you weren't nice. It doesn't help you on the last day. No Jesus, no life. No Jesus, no access. He's the only one who has access by right to God the Father. I think uh, you, you kind of have an example of this later in the Gospel of John. How did Peter get into the courtyard while Jesus was on trial? I think he won't. <laughs> John seemed to have some connections. Yes, yeah, he, he wasn't allowed in by himself, but John knew people. John got him in. It, it tells us that. That, that John was friends with, with people that, that were in charge of the temple. And so John said, basically, he's with me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do we get into the courtyard of God's throne room? That's exactly right. Jesus says, he's with me. She's with me. It's through Jesus that we, we, we gain access to God the Father. Try to go by yourself, and there's going to be a cherubim, a cherub with a flaming sword blocking your entry. Something like that. It sounds harsh, but it's also wonderful. Because it, it takes away all of our striving 
You're not being judged by how nice you are or how well you've done to get in. The question is only, do you know the son? And does the son know you? And not in an informational way, but are you in him? The father is in him and he is in the, in the father so that whoever is in Christ is also in the father. Um, Paul puts it this way, also in Colossians. Again, it's funny how Colossians, a lot of, a lot of uh, echoes of the language from John. And guess where Colossae wasn't far from? <laughs> Ephesus, Asia Minor, Ephesus. And that's where, where John was. John was a pastor in Ephesus. Uh, Paul says, our life is hidden with Christ in God. If you are in Christ and Christ is in God, then that's where we are. We are in God. Um, so, and, and we are, we've been placed there in our baptism. And as, as we continue to hear his word, to be, again, those disciples, those students of Jesus, we can know that we're in God. As, as much as our external circumstances may suggest otherwise, we have God's own word on us. We have Jesus' own promise. Nope. If you're in me and I'm in you, then we together are in my Father. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, I, I, I like kind of the image of um, it, 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 you have you know, some, some very fancy party or club, right, that, that you've got to be on the list. To, 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 to get in, right? And, 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 the, and the link someone who's not on that list will do to impress the bouncer, uh -huh. right? Or bribe the bouncer. Or, uh, but then there, there's one group that always gets let in, right? The group that's able to say, I'm with the band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get to say that, I'm with the band. The band being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, so, all right, Let, let's, let's press pause. Any questions about all that? Yeah, Benny. Yeah. So, where's the Holy Spirit? He's coming. He's okay. coming. <laughs> okay, but, um, all right. So, it says, uh, the words I say to you are not my own, they're the Father's. Mm -hmm. Believe in me when I say I'm in the Father, and the Father. Mm -hmm. And we have credit to the Father more creation than... Right. Yeah, so... He's coming. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry, Betty. Uh, Holy Spirit's going to be, be talked about quite a bit. It's just a matter of a few verses. Right. Several, several weeks ago, you suggested that we read, I forget what, 13 through. Yeah, 19. exactly. And to the end of 17, what, yeah. When you read it all as a single setting, yeah. what it says is the Trinity. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, yeah. Did you, yeah. When you read the whole thing, my goodness, you, you can't escape the reality of the Trinity. Right. That that, that uh, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to me. I'm going to bring it to, to, to the Father. The Father is in me. I am exactly over and over and over again. That's right. That's right. Yeah. In, in, in fact, I one one of the things to kind of ask, uh, tied in with this now not yet business, is in so many different places in this uh, exchange or this discourse, Jesus says both, I'm about to leave you and I'm always going to be present. And, 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 and so we, we want to try to wrestle with that and, and reconcile those two things. How can this be? And, and the, the getting the answer to that will <coughs> greatly help us understand how it is that the same disciples who were sorrowful when Jesus died on the cross and they thought this is it, it's over, were not sorrowful when Jesus ascended. <clears throat> yeah, they, they, they finally get these words in a way they didn't get them immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in, in a minute. Uh, verse 11, let's look at verse 11. Believe me, that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Remember what Nicodemus said when he first met up with Jesus at night in chapter three? 
way back in chapter three. He said, uh, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God's with him. We, we, we saw a similar thing in the case of the man born blind that Jesus healed in uh, John chapter nine. Remember when the Pharisees are interrogating him, I think for the second time, what, 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 what does he say back to them? This is John nine and verse 30. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to the sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. See, what's the blind man pointing to? The work that Jesus did. The works that he did. And so here's Jesus saying, if you won't believe in me, at least believe in the works I've done. And, and connect the dots from there. Um, so he, he uh, let's see, with 11. Okay, 11 in, in my Bible, when we move into 12, 13, or 14 before the next heading. Uh, but but I, I know some Bibles might even put another head. Do you have a heading before verse 12 in your Bibles? No. Before verse 15. Okay, before, yeah, it's, it's before verse 15 in mine as well. Sometimes they'll, they'll put a, a heading before verse 12 and, and separate it out. I, I can't impress upon you enough the importance of ignoring the headings. Because <laughs> the, the headings break up the text in a way the text wasn't originally broken up. All of this kind of flows together. Um, and if, if anything, the, the change in theme, that there is a kind of change of theme, it begins here, not, not in verse 15, but uh, let, 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 let's read. Um, well, let, let's do this. Let's read from 12 to 24, and then we'll come back to, to 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, we have another Jude in the bunch, said to him, Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. All right. So going back to, to verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. What an extravagant promise. They will do greater things than these because Jesus says, I'm going to the Father. Um, again, to note, this seems to be a slight change of theme because now the emphasis is on going away. Right? He's going away, and yet he won't be gone. Uh, it, it, it's like the old phrase, having your cake and eating it. Uh, he's going away, and yet he speaks of himself as present to, to try to make sense of that. So, What's Jesus talking about when he says greater works than these you will do? I mean, he turned water into wine. He uh, fed the 5,000. He killed the man born blind. 
What greater things could the apostles possibly do than these? It's got to be the great mission. Bringing the Gentiles in. Yeah, you know, you'll hear people say, if, if only Jesus were present with us in the way he was during his earthly ministry, yes. it'd be so much easier to believe in him. And yet we find over and over again in the Gospels how his being right there in front of them in a visible way seemed to hinder more than it helped. Uh, and, and, and moreover, he, he did all these things in a rather short amount of time. And in a very limited space, you know, just in that region of Galilee and, 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 and Judea. Um, so, but Jesus now, because he's going to the Father, he says, the apostles will do things far greater. And, and, and as, as, as Carolyn said, we've got at the end of Matthew, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So Jesus has, has done these signs and wonders and a, a few people have believed in him, sort of. <laughs> right? That's what we keep running into in the Gospel of John, especially. That those who are described as believers still don't get everything. Right? But because he's gone to the Father, the disciples are going to do greater works than these. They are going to bring people to a, a, a deeper faith than, than those who knew Jesus in his earthly ministry did. And, and, and much more than Jesus was able during his earthly ministry to bring to, to faith. Uh, that, that uh, I think, is how that gets fulfilled, that promise. Now, how about this? Do we have time to do it justice? Maybe. Whatever you ask in my name, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Here's the question Do you believe that? Do you really believe that if you ask him anything, he'll give it to you? Yeah. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce is the only one who will be honest and says no. <laughs> only Carolyn says no. Okay, all right. And Ray says no. Ray says no. Yeah, what, what, what's the key here? See, so what's the key? <laughs> what, what am I leaving out when I ask the question, do you believe that if you ask God anything, he'll give it to you? Well, well we, we don't, we don't, okay, you, 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 you're, you're, you're skipping. I want the words from the text itself. Jesus doesn't use the word will. What does he say? In my name. In my name. In my name. He doesn't say ask anything and you'll the Father will give it to you. He says, ask anything in my name, and the Father will give it to you. So that the key to this is the in my name part. And uh, this is a big problem with a lot of our sister, uh, well, let's not say sister. Let's say our, our Christian friends in other denominations. Um, if, if it's not the biggest, it's one of the biggest churches in America is in Houston, Texas. Oh, yeah. Oh. Pastored by a man named Osteen. Oh, yeah. uh, they have about 20,000 people in church every week. And one reason it's so popular <laughs> is that every week the pastor stands up and tells the congregation that God wants them to have a fulfilled, happy life. Right. Doesn't want you to suffer. And he tells all these inspirational stories. And, you know, one, one that, that, that I happened to have caught once, uh, he, he talks about uh, his parents uh, wanting a swimming pool, praying for a swimming pool. <laughs> and it just wasn't materializing. And then some wealthy couple flew in for the weekend to visit them. 
And right before they left, they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going we're gonna to build you a swimming pool. See there, isn't God great? Right? The message is they prayed and they really believed and they got what they want. If you pray and really believe, you'll get what you want to. Santa Claus. Yeah, and Santa Claus. But the, the problem is we have this emphasis on the anything divorced yeah. from the in my name. Now let's get a handle on what it means to pray in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Um, and, and we sometimes say, we, we literally say the words, in Jesus' name, amen, or in the name of Jesus, amen. And, and we want to be careful because it can so easily uh, come to mean in our own hearts something like almost the end, and amen means the end. That's all in the name of Jesus means, right? In the name of Jesus, amen. Almost the end, the end. No. First of all, what does amen mean? So be it. So be it. So be it. Yeah, so be it. I think something stronger than that, because the so be it to my ear is a kind of resignation. Right? So be it. It shall be so. It shall be so. It's an expression of confidence. To say amen, to say amen is to say um. Indeed, what I've just said is pleasing to God and is something God will answer, is, is a prayer that I have confidence that, that what I just prayed, God heard and, and will answer in the best way. That's what our amen is saying at the end. Remember, uh, verse 12, see that truly, truly? That's amen in the original. He's saying, amen, amen, I say to you. Amen, amen. Uh, he, Jesus does this a lot, where he prefaces what he's about to say with, with the amen word, which is a word that's saying, this is true. Yay, yay, truly, truly, indeed, indeed. Um, and and I, we, we made this point before, but it, it always bears repeating that in the Old Testament, what's striking about Jesus' use of amen is whenever you see an amen in the Old Testament, it always comes after the person that has said what he said. So you'll have the Israelites make a promise to God that we're, we're, we're going to do what you've commanded us to do. Amen. Uh, yes, we really mean it. But Jesus has his amen, puts his amen before what he says. See, now it makes sense for us as ordinary human beings to wait until after we've said it before we actually put the yes, that is correct at the end of it, right? It's, it's kind of like why we Lutherans sing our hymns so slowly. Um, we have to have time to read ahead and make sure what we're about to sing is doctrinally correct. <laughs> so kind of the same idea of putting the amen at the end of what we say, but Jesus puts his amen before, because this is Jesus who does not lie. And so he can guarantee the truthfulness of what he says, even before he says it. Um, I, I, I think... You know, in confirmation class, we have all these ways of talking about the ways in which Jesus proves that he is divine. Uh, he has divine names. He's worshipped. You know, Thomas bows down and says, my Lord and my God. The Father in heaven calls him his son. The son you know, this is my son whom I love you. He does divine works. He has divine attributes. He's omniscient. He's all-powerful. He can raise the dead, etc. And I think yet another proof that ought to be added is... He says truly, truly before what he says is said. Okay. Um, so this, this emphasis on uh, in the name, praying in his name. What we're really saying, besides with the amen, this is truly so, we are saying whether we say it or not. Yeah, let's not be too literalistic and say, oh, well, this is uh, Jesus saying uh, every prayer must literally have those words in them. We know that's not true. He gave us the Lord's Prayer, which doesn't literally have in Jesus' name in them. And yet every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are praying in Jesus' name. How so? To pray in his name 
is to pray in the confidence that our prayer is being heard because of him, through him. So, you know, to take a phrase, I guess, I don't think anyone uses anymore, but in the old days, at least in the old Westerns, right, the sheriff would come up and say, stop in the name of the law. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What's the point of that? What's the point of saying in the name of the law? What's that clarify? Yeah, see, he's saying, I'm not telling you to stop because I'm, I'm, you know, uh, uh, who, who's the uh, who's the guy that uh, what well, Wyatt Earp because I'm uh, because of me personally Wyatt Earp no no I'm telling you to stop because I Wyatt Earp represent the government the law in this place okay and so likewise when we pray to God in the name of Jesus we're saying I'm not coming as sinner Brent McGuire I'm coming as one died for by your son, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. He's my father only because Jesus has made him my father by adopting me into the family. And so that then means when we pray to God the Father in Jesus' name, God isn't hearing Brent McGuire. He's hearing Jesus. He's hearing Jesus. It's as if those words, another way of looking at it is it's like we've gone to Jesus and say, Jesus, you're continually praying to the Father. Could, could you add these petitions to, to, to the list of things you're bringing to him? And Jesus says, absolutely, and goes to the Father and says, uh, Brent would like this, this, and this. See, that's in the name of Jesus, praying in the name of Jesus, recognizing that we have access to God, confidence to pray to God. Because Jesus has made his father our father. And so he hears us as such. He hears our words as coming from Jesus himself. Um, if, if um, you know, let's say a, a little kid comes into my office and says, uh, I, I have a message from the mayor of Dallas for you. Okay. Now, as I listen to him speak, who am I listening to? Whose words am I hearing? I'm hearing the mayor's oh, words. Really? You trust them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> oh, that's the point. I mean, that's it, God doesn't hear you, Joyce. When you pray in the name of Jesus, he says, oh, this is coming from my own son. Yeah, see? So um, actually, you say, uh, Jesus, would you carry this message? <laughs> yeah, right, right. But but we're going to get a place, those of you who have read the whole thing, we're going to get a place where he's going to say, you don't have to go through me anymore. Yeah. Right, and we've we got we to unpack that. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot hangs on how it gets translated with the same verb in English. But uh, I don't want to spoil it, but you've got, um, there, there's two kinds of asking. There, there are two different asking words in Greek that our English, uh, alas, doesn't, doesn't bring out. Um, and and that, that helps us better understand what he's saying when we get to that point. But for now, if you ask me anything in my name, uh, I will do it. Uh, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. So this is the confidence we have in our praying. So what, what questions about that? Because there, there, there's so much we could, we could say in addition uh, about the privilege of prayer that, uh, that that can be grounded in these words to us from Jesus. Do you have any, any questions about that? It's not anything, I, mean, I, I guess I should say, go, going back to that, that original point, that anything versus anything in my name. When, when we, the, the, the primary meaning of, of that in my name is, is just what we said. That Christ uniquely gives us access to the Father so that when we ask him for things, we're asking in the confidence that that prayer is heard for his sake, for Jesus' sake. Now, what does that, how does that inform what we ask or what we ask for? <clears throat> knowing that, knowing that, what kinds of things do we then ask for? 
Bruce wants a Mercedes. <laughs> Right. I remember that. So do do we do 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 we go to, to, to the father in the confidence that when I ask for Mercedes, I'm gonna get it? Yeah, okay. So yeah. See as as we are as we are in Christ, as we are in Christ. Knowing Christ to be our gracious, loving Savior, knowing the Father to be gracious toward us on his account, when you see Jesus, you see the Father. We therefore know that the things we pray for may not be the best things for us, but we trust the love and the wisdom of the one to whom we pray to give us what's even better than what we ask, so that the, the in Jesus' name, or the thy will be done, that is in the Lord's prayer that, that we often will say in our own prayers. This is not a, a get out clause for God. This is not a, uh, dear God, give me, that, that, give me a Mercedes, but thy will be done, as if we're saying, you know, if some pagan is looking in and he doesn't give me that Mercedes, I, I want to remind that pagan that, I did say his will be done. And so, you know, sometimes God's like this and doesn't give me what I want. And, and that's okay. I, I gave him that out. I, I gave him that out. No, a thy will be done is, is a saying that this is as far as humanly speaking, I can tell is a good thing to ask for. But you know better. You know that if this thing that I ask for is not the best for me, then give me that better thing. That's what the thy will be done is about. It's confidence in him knowing even better than I do what I do for my eternal good. And it may not be the Mercedes. It may not turn out to be a Mercedes. You see, Joy says they're not that good. Terrible service record. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But the other thing right. is, we never know the time restraints either. Exactly. I mean, it may not be next week. It may be two years from now. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's that's right. And 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 we can also say this. I I, I know uh, from a circuit meeting so many months ago, Pastor was talking about how the prayer chain in his church was praying for a woman who who had, had been diagnosed with a very late stage cancer. And the prayer, prayer chain, it gathers together and they're praying. And maybe after about five minutes, you know, one of the ladies in the group says, you know, I think we're praying for the wrong thing. And, and so they, they started talking about it. Instead of praying necessarily for this lady to be healed or for the cancer to go in remission, let's pray that her faith be kept strong till the end. Right. And, and lo and behold, this, this particular woman did die within about a week of that prayer chain. Do you see? So the, the, the anything in my name, and, and as we pray, and the practice of prayer, and being grounded in God's word and knowing the kinds of things that God wants us to ask of him will lead us to, to decisions like that, where it's not always in the best interest of the person or that for that. And, and God knows in a way we don't obviously what's most important for this person's eternal well-being and it may not be that this person be healed at this this particular time right it may be better that she go home now to be with him in heaven that that kind of thing and so praying in his name and, and where do we look to know what kinds of things we should ask for in our prayers yeah, and, and, and there, there's a specific word, a specific answer to that question that Jesus gave his disciples. What is it? What does the catechism use to teach us? The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is, is, is a whole list of the kinds of things that God is most pleased to, for his, his children to ask of him. And six-sevenths of it are spiritual things. And one seventh is daily bread, all the things we need to support this body and life. So it's not wrong to ask for material, physical things, health, even the car, 
<laughs> uh, but let's never forget that Jesus prayed a prayer, the answer to which was no. Take this cup from me. Because his father and his infinite wisdom knew best that a greater good would come out of his drinking the cup, bearing the wrath of God against sin on the cross, than him being spared that. So, okay. All right, we've gone over by a little bit. I apologize. We'll pick up uh, from there uh, next time. Glad you could all be here. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful uh, privilege you give us of being able to take to you uh, any and all of our needs, our petitions, also our, our uh, praise and thanksgiving, uh, knowing that you hear our words for Jesus' sake. And that we can have that confidence that you as our father, uh, hear us as your dear children through your son, Jesus. Uh, help us grow in the practice of prayer and trusting in your promises that you attach to our prayers to you, that we may be all the bolder and are coming to your throne and asking you for all that we need, uh, knowing that you will give it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.